Hello and welcome to the North Carolina Museum of History and the 28th Annual American Indian Heritage Celebration Education Day. Our presenter, Sonora Lynch, will begin in just a moment, but we want to start with a few notes to begin with. We have many additional resources about American Indians in North Carolina on our website, nc-aihc.com. We thank the following sponsors of the North Carolina Museum of History Foundation, helping to make this event possible. Now let's get started. Sonora Lynch, a member of the Halawasa Pony Tribe, is well known for her handmade pottery which is made using the tradition of hand coiling white and red clay. She etches designs into each piece's surface, creating unique works of art that connect past and present. My name is Sonora Lynch. Kuwaito Shimali Teliepion, Awaskame Milalin Alishkwiak Akpohan. Thank you for having me here this morning. Those words come from the Suan language. I am Halawa Saponi, and those words mean good morning, how are you doing? You're welcome to be here, and thank you for having me here uh, in your presence this morning. It is such an honor to be here at the Museum of History in Raleigh, North Carolina, sharing my work across the world. It's just amazing that you are here, and we are here together. I am going to be talking about um, Native American pottery. My, my art particularly is called Living Traditions. Living Traditions. My tribe is Halawa Saponi, and we are part of the red clay people. So the word Saponi means people from the red clay. And as, as you see on the table, I have lots of art that's made out of red clay and white clay. I've gotten known for my pottery, my style of pottery. I've had professors from around the world who studied pottery from England to China to New York to Mexico and all over this country and said they had never seen pottery like mine. So I know I created my own style of pottery, my own way of, of interpreting or telling the traditional stories of my people, my American Indian people. And so my work is called Living Traditions. And when you look at my art, you can see it's alive. It's alive, it's living, it's breathing, it has character. It is part of our tradition, it's part of our living traditions. If you ever studied old Native American pottery, you can see that my art looks very different than some of the very, very old pots. But many of our people would take two clays and paint one clay on top of the other clay and create designs very different than the way I'm doing mine. Mine is very elaborate, more detailed, very fine, and very equal in balance. But I use the old ways to create the new ways. So all of my work is hand coiled. So I don't throw in the wheels like a lot of potters do. Everything I make is hand built by using a traditional coiling technique and also making what's called pinch pots. As you look on the table, I have um, bowls. I have sculptures of, of a woman. I have a bear. I have big pots. I have a dream catcher and a, and a platter on this side. And so I have been making pottery now probably more than 45 years altogether but 29 or so on a regular basis to put out into the public. When I was a young girl, I would go and help the elders carry clay and carry water. And in the 70s, we were reviving our pottery. So we were reviving our pottery and to revive something, it means to bring it back. So it's sort of like somebody having a heart attack when they're almost gone, they're almost gone, but they're still here. You revive them and you bring them back. So what I thought was so beautiful when I was a young girl, I was about 14 years old. What I thought was so beautiful about bringing back our pottery in the 70s is as our elders were um, learning themselves to remake pottery, they were also talking about their mothers and their grandmothers who made pottery. So we never really completely lost it, but we didn't have to make pottery like we did hundreds and hundreds of years ago. In the old days, we had to make pottery for everything pottery for carrying water, pottery to cook inside, pottery to store food inside, pottery for our ceremonies, pottery for our effigies. So pottery was used for lots of things. 
We still use pottery today in some of the traditional forms. We still use pottery in the traditional smudging ceremonies where we have pottery bowls that we use in, in special ceremonies. We also have wedding vases that are used in today's wedding ceremonies. We have some vessels that are used to cook inside during special times. But after the European contact came, we didn't have to use pottery the same way we did hundreds of years ago. Once the Europeans came over here, they started bringing some of the metal and iron pots over. And so the use of pottery changed over time. We also had special ceremonies. Many of you might have uh, pottery shards or arrowheads or artifacts that you find in your family garden or sometimes in the cornfields and the tobacco fields and in the cotton fields. You'll find old pottery shards or broken pieces of pottery. Our people would actually break pottery during a special ceremony called the green corn ceremony. And each year those pots were actually broken. It was a renewal time, a time to renew and bring back new pots. And so many of you might find arrowheads and pottery shards and other artifacts. And that tells you that the land you live on at one time belonged to American Indians. And so if your grandparents have found arrowheads, you know, sometimes people keep these things in a closet or in a basement or, or somewhere and nobody gets to see them. But I uh, would like for you guys to think about, you know, donating them back to the Native Americans or donate them to a museum near yourself so we can keep these traditions alive. And so that Native Americans also can have an opportunity to see the things that belong to their ancestors. So my pottery is uh, called Living Traditions, and I consider it both contemporary and traditional. I consider it traditional because it's still hand-built and hand-coiled the old way. So I, I take long pieces of, of coils, and I roll them out, and I stack them up and make them into pots, and I make really big pots with the coiling technique. My work is also traditional because all of the designs that I put on my work come from native stories and traditions of my people. Things my mother told me, my grandmother told me, my grandfather, and things that I decided that these are the things that I grew up with and these are the things I'm going to put on my pottery. So I decided that I would create my own vessels and tell our story through the clay. So I often say I speak through the clay or the clay allowed me to have a voice. <clears throat> I remember when I was a little girl, I, or years ago when I first started um, showing my work to the public, I was very shy and um, very inside myself, you could say. I, I really didn't talk much, <laughs> didn't want to say anything to anybody, but through my art, it gave me a voice. Um, after I started making pottery, I started presenting it in public, and people started seeing my work, and then it gave me the opportunity to bring it out more and let more and more and more and more people see my work, but also give me the opportunity to talk about my tribe. And so now people know more about my tribe, which there's uh, many tribes in North Carolina. Many of you know of the Cherokees, but there are also uh, eight tribes in the state of North Carolina. And I am one of the third largest tribes in the state. And so I'm honored and proud that my ancestors fought hard for us to be here. And I'm proud that I can say we are here. We are here after everything we've gone through, all the movement and changes that we've gone through, we are still here. And so that's an honor to say. So on the table, you see I have lots of different um, turtles, bowls. I have a bear. I have um, jewels on my pottery. Uh, and I have different designs. I'll start with this one. This one is called the Robin Dance. And it's in honor of the Robin Bird. And they would always say that when the robin comes out, it means the warm weather's coming, it's time to get out and dance. And so around home, we have a dance called the robin dance in honor of the robin. And what we do is we dance up and down, up and down like a roller coaster, just like the design on this pot. It moves up and down. And the robin bird, when he's out uh, dancing, he's looking for food. And so the little pieces, uh, little worm-like things at the bottom represents the food that the robin is looking for. This design right here is his tail. So he's flapping his wings, he's rejoicing, he's dancing, and we move in a circle. And all of our dances go in a circle. So it's an honorable dance that we do in honor of the robin. So we use the birds as a message. 
the teachers how to live, the teachers about the weather and how things are going to change. Uh, one thing I'd like to inspire you to know is my ancestors were scientists. They were very wise people, very knowledgeable about the land and the trees, the moon, the stars, the plants, the animals. They were very wise in all of their knowledge. So they were scientists. They knew how to find clay. And one of our people would always say that if there's crawdads nearby, which is a crayfish, um, if it's crawdads nearby, it's really good clay. If you find dirt daubers, which is a bee, and he makes his nest out of clay, if you find a dirt dauber, you know that there's really good clay there. So by following the animals, it taught our people how to find clay. And so that's a science itself. You know, you could go around North Carolina and you could dig up dirt from many places, but not all dirt in North Carolina is good for making pottery. So you have to know the clay sources. So by following the animals, they taught our people how to find clay. And also from our elders who taught us because they remember it, they always will remember their mothers and their mothers and their mothers going to dig clay. And so they would teach us how to find it. This particular piece is called Your Hands Can Heal. This is probably one of my most recent favorite pieces that I've made. And on this design, all of these lines are hand carved. So I don't use any stencils or anything like that. I just start creating and thinking about the design I want to put on each piece of pottery. But this one is in honor of my grandmother, who was a healer. Um, <clears throat> if you ask her that, she wouldn't say she was, but everybody would come to her for medicine and plants because she knew the earth so well, and she was known to be a healer. And, and um, she would say that you know, she could heal with her hand, but she would always give honor to the creator and say, without the creator, I can do nothing. But she knew the medicine plants. And on this particular piece of pottery, first of all, it has four hands for the four directions, for the earth, wind, fire, and water. It has all of these medicine plants. It has flag root. It has uh, grapevines and birds. It has blackberries. It has tobacco. It has corn. It has mullein. It has a choke cherry. And all of these plants are medicines for healing. The choke cherry, for example, is used for healing people with asthma. So they would take the, the little slimy green part of the tree and make a tea. And so if someone was having like an asthma attack, they would actually drink that tea and it would calm their, um, their chest down and calm down their asthma. So it also has flag root, which is right here. And it has strawberries. And the flag root is used for um, heartburn. Um, ulcers in the mouth, in, um, congestion, anything that has to do with the mouth and the chest. And then it has blackberries, which is our food source, good for our blood. It has pine, which is a medicine plant that we use for our colds and coughs. And so a lot of the medicine today made by modern uh, scientists and people, a lot of it derived or came from the American Indians. And a lot of people are going back to the old ways and going back to the natural medicines. But this is one that I created. And um, this is red clay. And it has white clay that's painted on top. And once I paint the white clay on top, I etch through my designs. So it's a hand, hand etching and carving technique that I use to create my, my designs on my pottery. This one right here is corn and tobacco. And this one has the tobacco. And you'll notice on a lot of my work, you'll see turtles, you'll see corn, you'll see tobacco, you'll see dogwood flowers. And all of those things are, are lessons from the land. For instance, the dogwood flower uh, teaches us that it's time for springtime and new beginnings. Also, it has the tobacco, which is a healing medicine for bee stings and rapid wounds. It has the corn, which is used for baby powder. And my grandmother would actually take the corn shucks and use them as bandages. It has the stairway up into the heavens. And it has the arrowhead down at the bottom to show underneath the earth is where our foundation is. Then it has the corn flowers. 
And I put this design on here because I wanted it to show that the rain goes from the top to the bottom. So we get the, the rain and water and how important water is. And so that's how I came up with this idea. And I just kind of, uh, many of my ideas come to me in dreams. Sometimes when I'm sleeping, I'm dreaming about pottery. I remember one time I was oh, lying in bed with my husband and we were lying there asleep and I started blowing in the night. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm working on a piece of pottery. <laughs> so while I was sleeping, I was working on pottery. So a lot of my ideas come to me in my dreams and while I'm sleeping. And so the creator sends me those ideas like that through the night sky. This one right here is called a seed pot. And inside this bowl, it's packed with corn seeds. So it's considered a preserving jar. And so our people always believed in saving seeds for up to five generations ahead. So that's really preparing for the future. So what I did with this one is I made a small bowl. I created a hole in the top. I stuffed the corn seeds on the inside and they will be, be safe and preserved inside this jar for hundreds of years. They actually found an old piece of pottery um, over 3,000 years old, and inside the pot was squash seeds. And they took those squash seeds up to New York to the Mohawk Indians, and they brought those seeds back to life. And Nana grows a squash about this big. And so it's amazing that that was an old um, thing that Native Americans did, was store their seeds inside a piece of pottery. This one has an eagle design, and it has a lot of roses. It has turtles, and it has flowers, and it has um, feathers on the top. And this one is in honor of my daughter, and her Indian name is Pechi Stakwia, which means eagle with sparks in her tail. And she loves roses, and our people would also make tea out of a wild rose. And then it has the turtles on here to represent our family. So this is um, called a seed pot. But what we would do during special times of our ceremonies is these are broken to get the seeds out. So they're actually broken during a ceremony. And a ceremony is a special occasion where we come together and we celebrate for one reason or another, whether it's uh, honoring of our elders, whether it's um, coming of age ceremony, whether it's going into a sweat lodge. So we have many different types of ceremonies. And so her Indian name was given to her during a very special ceremony where we had for our young women. So we had a, a ceremony called the coming of age. And so her her given name is uh, Pechis Takwia, which is eagle with sparks in her tail. And so that's one of her pieces. And so far, I've only put those jewels on her particular pieces of work. And I've only put eagles on her work so far. This one right here on the table is another seed pot. That one has a turquoise turtle on top. It has four turtles going around. And that one is um, packed with corn seeds. Sometimes I put squash seeds, beans, watermelon, all kinds of seeds can be stored inside um, our seed pots like that. Some of you might recognize what this is, except it's a little different than your dream catcher. So this one's called Catching a Dream of a Lifetime. And you might have a dream catcher, but I'm pretty sure that it's not inside the turtle shell this way. So this is a, a turtle. This is another one that I dreamed about. I had never seen the dream catcher inside the clay turtle. And so when I was sleeping, I saw these turtles crawling through my sleep. And as they were crawling, the web started growing and coming into the body of the turtle. And so as I was sleeping, the design started to come. And then I woke up from my dream and I wanted to stay in that dream because it was such a beautiful dream. And so I, um, I said, wow, I didn't finish my designs. And so the creator said, as you make them, the designs will come. And so every time I make a dream catcher, everyone is different. But this uh, came to me in a dream. And so the dream catcher is to protect our dreams. So we have a lot of good dreams and bad dreams. The original dream catchers were little tiny circles that were made out of grapevines or weeping willows. 
And so now this is my style of making my dream catcher inside the body of the turtle. And this one's called Blackberry Winter. Now, our people always follow the moon. And so the moons on here, there's five moons. One, two, three, four, five. There's five moons. There's a bear and then this blackberry design. So on the design, I have the blackberry flowers. I have the bear tracks. Uh, I have the moons that represent the moon of May. So January, February, March, April, May is the moon when the blackberries are getting ready to bloom. And if the cold weather comes, it means the blackberries are going to be real fat and plump. And so not only does Mother Earth feed us as humans, but it also feeds the animals. So the bear comes out in May in uh, May, looking for his food. So it's a symbol of the bear coming out. And it's a symbol of new life, new beginnings. And so when the blackberries are coming, the weather's changing, and it's a sign that we will be fed, which is awesome to know that the creator is going to feed us from the earth. And we call the earth Mother Earth. We call the earth Mother Earth because she's our mother. Uh, she takes care of us. She gives us food. She gives us clothing. She gives us hides. She gives us our houses, our concrete to build our buildings. Our bricks are made out of the earth. Everything is from the earth. And we call her Mother Earth because not only are we honoring her because she gives us everything we need, but also we honor her as a woman. So we call her Mother and we honor her as a woman. So just as you respect your mother, you should respect the earth as well. So you, we, we um, think about the earth and all that she gives to us. This is another one of my pots. This is a big pot. Great big pot. This took a lot of work. Took a lot of work to finish this piece of pottery. This one is a coiled pot. So I don't throw in the wheels like a lot of potters. Everything I make is hand coiled. And the design on here is... Uh, called the gift. This is all about the gift. And I name my pottery because oftentimes when you enter your art into art competitions, they want a title on your pottery. So I name my pottery. So this one's called the gift. And it's all about the gifts of life. It has the turtle, which is the gift of new life, new beginnings. It's the gift of our children, our babies, our next generation to come. It has the four turtles for the four directions, for the four generations of the next babies and the next babies and then it has a dogwood flower now a lot of you guys know of the dogwood flower as a north carolina's flower and it is one of the state's flowers north carolina but the dogwood flower for us is a symbol of springtime coming around as soon as the little leaves on the dogwood flower bloom our people know that it's time to start tilling the land and but what i mean by tilling the land it means to break up the soil to run your rows into your garden and to break the soil to begin to prepare the land to get ready to plant our corn and our tobacco right here. This is the tobacco design. And so on the top of it, it has a design called, um, comes from the beaver's tail and it's a crisscross pattern. And that means life is plentiful and good. So right here on the top, right there on the top is a crisscross pattern. And that means that life is plentiful and good. And so the turtle is our life, the human life. The dogwood flower is springtime, new beginnings. The tobacco is our medicine. The corn is also our medicine. So this is our spiritual and our physical medicine that comes together. And so this one is called the gift is all about the gifts of life. And that's a big pot. I think I probably have about 20 or 25 coils on this pot. And it started with just the bottom base, a big flat piece. And then I started wrapping coils around and around and around. And then I smooth them out with my hands and I mend them together. And then it, it creates into a pot, into a vessel. So this one would be considered a cooking pot. Now today... I don't really cook inside my pottery. I could if I wanted to, but my pottery is used as an art form.
to tell the story and the history of our people. And sometimes I wonder, I think, well, what are scientists going to think one day when they dig my pots up out of the ground? Because I imagine one day they will be under the ground just like all other pottery is. So I think, what, what will scientists think when they find my pottery? What do you think they will think? What do you think the scientists would think if they dug up my pottery and found it? You know, as, as I've gotten older and I look around life, when I was a kid, cornfields were everywhere. Everywhere we looked, you could see a cornfield. Everywhere there was tobacco fields. And so now when we look around, we don't see that as much as we used to. So when we think about time and how things pass on and, and uh, change, we don't really know if we're going to have corn in the future. So I, I think, um, what are they going to think when they dig up my pot? Are they going to know what type of animal this is? Are they going to know what type of plant this is? Because when we dig up some of our ancient pottery, oftentimes we don't know what the designs represented and, um, until our elders tell us what those designs meant. But there's a lot of things to know about pottery. <clears throat> And it's, we have uh, some beautiful um, pieces of pottery that's historically been found here in North Carolina. And they found pottery thousands and thousands of years old. And that really tells us about our ancestors. This one is a deer design. And I also dreamed about this one as well. And this one is in honor of our men. This is called the Great Hunter. And this is in honor of our men because our men are usually the hunters. But even though my aunt, Aunt Lacey, she was really known for being a better hunter than the men. So women can hunt as well. But usually it's it was uh, referred to as a man's job. The woman's job was to keep the house and, and take care of the fields where the man's job was to go out hunting. Well, this is a deer. This is the bow. This is the arrow. This is his tracks. And so the deer is our provider. My husband likes to say he's our, our modern um, Walmart. <laughs> we get everything from the deer. We get clothing from his hides. We get rugs. We make tools out of his bones. We get musical instruments from his deer hoofs. We make uh, tools out of the antlers. We make knives, handles out of the deer's antler. My grandfather, he would actually make a glue out of the deer's uh, antlers. He would actually make a glue by chopping it up and boiling it down and it becomes real sticky and sappy. And so he would make a glue out of the antlers. The swirl is a symbol of the spirit of the deer. We believe when we take the deer's life, we take a part of his spirit and that spirit becomes a part of who we are. And also the bow and arrow is to show that if you're going to hunt, you also have to know how to make your bow and make your arrow. So all of this is skills that come. This is the deer's track. In order to be a good hunter, you have to know how to find a deer. And so we get everything from the deer. But what we also do is we give honor to the deer when we take his life. So we say a prayer over the deer and we use the tail and the brain. The brain is used to condition the hides. And what that does is it makes it waterproof. It makes it stronger and it makes it last for a long time. The tail of the deer, the men put something on their heads called a peshaw, and that's a hat or uh, sometimes called a roach, and that's made out of the deer's tail. So all the parts are used. Nothing is wasted on the deer. Everything is used. The bones, the toenails, um, the antlers, the body, everything about the deer is used, and so we don't waste any of that. So the deer is one of our are very, very important, important animals, just as all animals are. So on the table, I have some of my pottery tools. I'm sure you guys know what this is. This is a corn cob. And this is used to roll on the clay to make different textures. It's a really cool, just a natural tool, you know. If you eat corn, you have a corn cob. This is a rope paddle. It's used to pat on the clay to make textures on the clay and also to pat the clay to get the air bubbles out of the clay. So this one's called a rope paddle. 
This one's called a fishnet paddle. And this one's used to make a fishnet design, which is a crisscross pattern used to stamp on the pottery. This right here is one of my scratching tools or what we call a scoring tool. And this one is just a little piece of a, of a pine tree, a soft pine called a white pine. And I took these little needles and stuck inside. One of our elders showed me how to make that. His name was Alvin Evans. He's a, he was a great pottery artist. And this is a reed, just a wild natural stick that comes out of the earth. A reed used to make little dots and circular shapes. This is a trimming tool used to trim the side of a pot like this. So I use that to trim it and also it creates this concept of a design. This is a snuff can lid and the snuff can lid is also used for trimming. It's one of my favorite tools used to trim away the clay. And my grandfather dipped snuff, my grandmother dipped snuff till she was 93. She died when she was 96. So back then, tobacco didn't have all the poison in it that it has today. But my grandfather, he dipped snuff probably all his life. So dipping snuff was no big deal. Uh, <clears throat> dipping snuff was part of our tradition, part of our old ways. And our people believed that tobacco was medicine. And this is red clay. And I'm going to show you how to make a uh, pinch pot, a pinch pot out of clay. So this is red clay, and this comes out of the earth. And just as I say, our tribe is the Saponi Indians, and we are people from the red clay. All of my pottery is made out of red clay and white clay. And even this piece right here, it, it, it is black, but it's made out of red clay and white clay. And I added iron oxide into the clay, and it made it change colors. So while I'm patting it like this, this is called kneading the clay. Getting the clay together to get out all your air pockets. Now many of you may have made pottery before. You may have made a pinch pot. Or you may have made a coil pot. But I do mine a little bit different than some people do. I remember when I was uh, young and uh, we were starting to make pottery at the, actually we, um, we were doing our pottery at the Halawasaponi Indian School. And that was way back uh, in the 70s. And we used to, it was a little old building that we all sat inside and made pottery. And I remember our elders, they were always inspiring and teaching. And one thing I think about my own self is I always loved helping. I always loved to shuck corn and, and, and uh, peel beans. I loved working in tobacco. So I always loved helping. But I, one thing I always loved was just listening to our elders talk. And with hanging around with elders, you can learn a lot of things. They teach you a lot of things about life and how we should carry ourselves and how we should continue our tradition. And my family and my people, we have stayed strong. We, my mom said we survived because we were so stubborn. <laughs> we were determined people. We had uh, resilient. We, we refused to give up. And that's why we're here today, because we refused to let go and give up. And we survived. <clears throat> so what I do is just take my finger and start creating this hole inside. Then I'm going to take two fingers and put inside and I'm going to spin it around. And every time I'm just going to add more fingers and make this get bigger and wider and wider. And this is probably one of the first things I learned how to do was make little bowls. And then I graduated to making bigger and bigger bowls. One thing I like to tell people about pottery is clay is like no other medium. You know, you can work on a big, beautiful bowl, and then you can put it in the fire, and it breaks. 
Our people would say that when your pottery cracks, the spirits are released and the spirits are happy. And so that was a way of teaching us how to overcome things. The other thing is, is with pottery, is you never know what you're going to get until you go through the fire. That's kind of how life is. You know, we never know what's going to happen until we go through the fire. And then when we come out of the fire on the other side, we have a beautiful bowl. So does anyone have any questions? Thanks, Sonor, for that. Yeah, remember to ask your questions in the chat. And people are absolutely loving your work and loving what you've been sharing. And so one question we have is why turtles? Turtles are a very important animal. We have a place at home called Panacea Springs. And at Panacea Springs, there's a huge turtle rock. It's my favorite place in the world to visit. It's a sacred ceremonial grounds where the turtle's at. Our people say that we should keep the turtle around because when he's gone, the world's going to come to an end. So that's one of our old sayings. The turtle is also a symbol of long life. It represents Mother Earth, the creator. It represents Grandmother Moon. And next time you see a turtle, I want you to count the blocks on his back. On the back of every natural turtle, they have 13 blocks. Sea turtles, land turtles, sliders, um, box turtles. All the turtles have 13 big blocks. And around the bottom, they have either 28, 27, or 29 because the moon changes 13 times through the year. And every block on the turtle shell represents one of those moons. And so our people always said that the turtle was important and is one of our family clans, our animal clans. And so that's why I do turtles. I do turtles and bears. And, um, those are my two spirit animals. So many questions coming in. Uh, mostly about, let's get to the hows of the pottery. They want to know, do you paint your pottery? Do you fire your pottery? How hot is the fire? Where do you find your clay? All those things. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, the, the clay is from North Carolina. It is a North Carolina red clay. I used to dig my clay, but now I just go and find clay at different clay companies that make clay. And so um, that's where my red clay comes from. Um, what was, was some of the other questions? So do you fire your pottery? Mm -hmm. And how hot is that fire? Do you know? It fires to up to 1800 degrees. So it fires really, really hot. Um, I do let them dry in the air for about five to 10 days, depending on each piece. And then they're fired for about uh, 16 hours altogether. So it's a long process, but it's a very enjoyable process. Can you show us how you put texture on that pot you're making? Okay, yes. I can show you how to put the natural uh, texturing tools here that I have on the table. My other pots, um, those are painted with the white clay. So I don't really have the white clay right in front of me as far as drawing the designs on the pots. But those are all completely painted with the white clay. And then I draw my designs and etch out the background. So, for example, this right here is a corn cob. And what we do with the corn cob is we roll it onto the clay. And we roll it like this. And it makes this corn cob texture. Like that. Beautiful. It's so cool. I think it's the coolest thing ever because it, it looks like the corn is still on the inside of it. That's amazing. That's amazing. And somebody wants to know what the bear represents to you. The bear is um, the bear on the table is called my brother spirit. And the bear is considered the strong one in the tribe. He's the, he's one of our animal clans and he's the keeper of peace. So we have a traditional dance that our people would do called the bear dance. And we would go around growling, rawr, rawr, but it's all about laughter and joy. So the bear is strong and he's holding his people on his back. And on the bottom of the bear, it has a plant called bear grass. And our bear grass is used for weaving baskets and making rope out of the stalk inside of the bear grass. But the bear is all about peace and harmony and unity and dancing together. So switching topics, people are interested in your ribbon shirt. Are you? Can you share about what you're wearing? Yeah, my, um, my ribbon shirt is made by one of my tribal um, members. She made this for me. She's a beautiful seamstress. And I design it. I come up with the ideas, the colors, and the fabric. And my necklace is made by Pure Fay. 
Pirithe is one of my tribal sisters. She is part of the Tuscaroras and the Kahari people. And she gifted me this beautiful wampum and pearl necklace. And the pearls were something that were found here in North Carolina. And there's a writing in one of uh, John White's drawings. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the pearls and how important the pearls were to the Indians of North Carolina. And then the queen wanted pearls for herself. So this one was gifted to me and it's a, just an outstanding, beautiful piece of work that she gave to me. That's absolutely amazing. So who taught you to make pottery? So when I was a little, about 14, um, there was Miss Nett, uh, Miss Velma, Miss uh, Sally. There was many of our women, they were making pottery and and I would just sit with them and they were starting to move pots. I was actually there just to clean up. I was, I was there to clean up the, the mess that they might make to wipe the tables off and to, to carry the clay and carry the water. But being a helper to them, that allowed me the opportunity to make pottery. Never did I think that I would be making pottery for the whole world to see. I have pottery in China, I have pottery in England, I have pottery at a, a monastery. I have pottery in lots of places and never did I know when I was a little girl learning to make pottery. I was just doing it for the tradition because it was our way to make pottery. Never did I think that I would be here talking in public to you guys about my tribe and my pottery. We have so many questions. We have time for one more quick one, though, and that is, do you have a favorite piece of pottery? Hmm. <laughs> at, on the table at the moment, I always say the bear is my boyfriend. So... <laughs> So I keep the bear with me all the time. But this piece right here with the, the platter with the hands on it, it just, uh, it, just, it just moved me when I made it. It made me feel really good about my knowledge, about my grandma. And so that's probably my favorite piece. Um, I do want to give honor to my mom and my father and my grandfather because my mother and my sister would always say, Mom, just let you sit at the table and make your pottery and make your art. And I had to wash dishes and clean the floor and clean the house. And so I think my mother saw, saw this in me and allowed me to be this person. Thank you so much, Sonora. And thank you, everybody, today. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all your questions. We have more information on our website. Sonora, as always, you're such a gift with your words and your art. Thank you so much, everybody.